Okay, welcome back, and uh, we're going to finish up uh, this weekend with the first part of uh, lecture number five. I'm not going to cover the whole thing. Uh, in fact, I'll go for maybe a half hour or so, and uh, just give you some information about what is in lecture number five. Uh, it is sort of relevant to the course, but then at the same time, it's sort of overkill in terms of uh, internet working. It um, highlights some concepts that I thought I'd mention. Um, in the weekday section, I'll probably do a little bit longer on this, uh, but for you guys and for the purposes of maximizing your weekend here, the reason why this lecture is in here is to discuss IP and to give you a full understanding of IP, which is really a networking concept. So what I'm going to do is kind of breeze through and see how far I can get in about a half hour or so, and then uh, we'll call it quits for this weekend. So the motivation for internet networking, um, I don't have to give you a sales pitch, the LAN, the WAM technologies. Uh, well, LAN technologies provide high-speed communication across short distances, WANs for larger areas. No single networking technology is best for all needs, which is the point to take home on that. As an example, Ethernet might be the best solution for connecting computers in an office. Frame Relay might be a better solution for interconnecting computers from city to city instead. In terms of a universal service, it allows arbitrary pairs of computers to communicate together. This is what IP is actually good for. It provides a universal protocol, increases individual productivity in terms of being able to communicate. The solution in internet working or the internet provides that universal service among the different types of networks. It uses both hardware and software. It's not restricted to size. IP networks are pretty big if you haven't noticed, but we can also have smaller ones. And the concept of routing that fits into the IP network, which is kind of interesting in terms of the basic components what we're doing is preventing or creating, actually I shouldn't say preventing, we're creating a situation in which multiple computers of all different types can speak the same language and communicate and they can all send messages back and forth. Well, we have to have a router essentially to connect the components and to connect the pieces. So the convenience of the router, in fact routers these days have uh, firewalls on them, virus protection on them, they have all sorts of their intelligent routers these days. Uh, so it's convenient. It's a piece of device that actually has a processor and some memory on it, a separate I.O. interface for each one of the networks that it connects to, and it can connect LANs and WANs and all sorts of different things together. And it works off of the physical addressing scheme or frame formats as well in terms of its connectivity. And uh, it consists of network interconnections. So we have, uh, and this is not a networking course, so I hesitate to even get into these concepts. However, it goes without saying, we have to actually con consider gateways and routers and relays and repeaters and all sorts of network equipment when we start building networks because sometimes it interferes with our ability to create that distributed environment um, and sometimes it creates a bottleneck or it doesn't route traffic correctly. These are just underlying hardware components that from a software engineer perspective you don't necessarily even think about. In fact, most people that build internet applications aren't really thinking about the hardware that's underneath them. Um, so, single router is seldom used uh, because we end up with inefficiencies. We're dealing with multiple different types of routers that are out there normally. Redundancy improves internet reliability as well because we have different places to go. So, it's like having different types of stoplights and having different traffic flow on a freeway or a side residential street, many different options or streets to go down. Uh, so the internet scheme allow, itself allows you to choose the number of types of networks, the number of routers, the exact in, uh, interconnection and the topology that you're going to use. And that's kind of an important consideration when considering if you actually have to build the intranet from scratch, you're going to end up coming up with the architecture for the network itself. And uh, that architecture might vary. So although you as a developer who is writing the application is probably not going to be doing this stuff, it's going to be the IT people who are actually going to need to be assembling these pieces, not a bad idea to kind of consider what you're working with. And so in terms of a virtual network, it offers a universal service. So each computer is assigned an address and can communicate with other computers. So we have the internet as a virtual network system as an example. And it's really referred to as a virtual network. So this is sort of a refresher on vocabulary. Protocols for internet working, and we've seen this already in terms of the TCP running over IP, widely used. Um, in terms of the layering of the model, contains the five, five this one's going to have five layers in it. Wow. So here's our five layer compared to our seven layer I talked about earlier. So this is a newer slide set, obviously, <laughs> with the modified five layers. 
you can see which one has been removed. Also called the internet. In fact, a lot of people just call networking in general the internet. It's become the generic word, actually. Um, it didn't actually start out being the generic word for networking, though. Um, so I'm not going to, this is sort of a repeat, so I'm going to kind of skip through it. And I'm going to kind of skip through this as well. But if you want to see the five layer model, that's what we're working with in terms of our seven layer. So you can compare the two. And then DoD actually kind of uses a stripped down version of the OSI model as well. They don't even go with all seven layers. In terms of addressing, this is where we're addressing the IP issue, the host name, the addressing that we've been using in some of the examples we saw earlier today. In terms of the internet being an abstraction created entirely of software and addresses and stuff. Uh, so to guarantee uniform addressing, the protocol software defines the addressing scheme. This is a man-made setup. It's, it's interesting though how a man-made setup can be so widespread and universally accepted. So. Uh, because it's built into the protocols, it's built into the standard. Everybody understands IP addressing, all the routers, the gateways, the networks themselves. So the abstraction of the addressing is assigning a host and a unique address to communicate, as we've seen before. So we saw the host and the addressing scheme uh, in terms of the IPs. And user application programs from higher level protocols use abstract addresses to communicate as well. In terms of the addressing scheme, what we're looking at is addressing the specifics of the IP, so the internet protocols. Right now, on IP4, this lecture is based on IP4. Actually, it's not based on IP6. I believe it's on IP4 still. I don't know if I can't remember actually if I have even anything six related in it, but I'm not sure I might actually. I'm sorry. One of the assignments is on that. In fact, the one of the assignments. Yeah. Um, that I would highly recommend doing some reading on. It's more than just the length of the address. It's the it's more than just the, the header differences as well. Yeah, there's difference between well the numbering, the unique numbering scheme, but there's also differences within the format as well. Um, they are compatible though, which is kind of interesting. But the headers are definitely different. The size, the numbering system is definitely different. I would do some research. One of the assignments does have you compare IP4 with IP6. And this, I don't know if this lecture is really going to give it to you. So don't expect it to. A unique uh, value that's assigned. It might actually, I can't remember. But there might be a slide coming up. Um, there's a hierarchy to it. Each computer is located, and we've seen the hierarchy before. And we've seen this actually in the previous lecture I've given you today, where we've got the address that determines the boundary between the networks and the the network prefix and the host prefix. So it divides out so classes of A, B, and C. And the different classes actually meant something in the past. Now they don't really mean that much. So, In fact, even some of the subnets don't have the same significance as they used to have. So, so you know, some companies had better subnets, bigger ranges. And what I'm really talking about is allotting huge ranges of addresses to ISPs who are giving them to lower I shouldn't say lower level, but it is hierarchical. Uh, connectors or clients connecting to the server are going to give out lower level IPs to service providers that are going to be sharing the IP address banks. Um, but if you look at them, you can, and we still have the classification going on, by the way, though, and they are self identifiable by the numbers themselves, so the classes of the addresses can be computed from the address itself, actually. And the same number you've seen for IP4 still holds true, actually. And the class of the address was essentially supposed to tell you a little bit of identification about where where you are in the network and how you got connected, essentially, and where, where in the IP addressing you stand. The dotted decimal notation that we're all familiar with, the syntax for it, um, it uses uh, interacting with humans, essentially. I don't know what human would actually think that that was human speak, seriously. But uh, it was to make it more readable, because it is a lot more readable than that. So the numbers are definitely more readable. Expresses 8-bit sections of a 32-bit number uh, as a decimal value. Uses dots to separate the octets and stuff like that. So I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm just putting this out here as a review, sort of refresher, things to think about in terms of some of the concepts. Because what ends up happening is we just take this stuff for granted. We say, hey, give the IP address. What do you mean by the IP address? So if you've had a networking class, you've had all this stuff before. So the classes do not contain the same type of network, usually. They, they have different types of networks that are supposed to be in terms of the class address, class modifications. Each network prefix must be unique. 
An organization contains network numbers from their ISP that ISP corresponds with a central organization, the Internet Address Numbering Authority. Still around, actually. We still have the Internet Address, the Internet Assigned Number Authority. It's interesting, though, how domain names have changed, actually. We used to and how um, na domain name registration is still being run the same, but uh, a lot of small servers. You can put up any domain name you want for the lookup. It actually kind of works, but Depends on how slow the work, how slow you want the resolution to work. You, know, you go with a big name provider, it's going to be on a server that can house a lot of requests. It's going to go faster. But you can actually hook up your own free domain name service, domain name lookup. Um, in fact, there's a utility. I mean, I can't remember the name of the website, but there's a, there's a way of doing that, and it's just nothing more than having a server out there that's going to do the resolution for you. So here's an addressing example where we've got different prefixes over here with different prefixes over here in terms of the router and so the naming scheme is allowing the routing to exist and it's the basis for the router implementation so if this wasn't standardized at all we have no way of going to Fry's and buying a router and hooking it up <laughs> it wouldn't work actually because everybody's routing would be not not sufficient kind of like how we have a telephone addressing you know with an area code long distance codes um, actually, in the old days, there was a little bit more sense. In fact, you can say the same thing for IP addresses. In the old days, you could look at the IP address and actually sort of identify. In this example in here, the area code 408 was everybody in San Jose or something like that. And then it had different prefixes like 244 and 12 something or other. It gave you different cities, you know, and this, and, or different areas or blocks. Now, they give you any number you want. If you want a number, here's a number, you know. And the numbers make no sense, actually, in terms of the location. Like, there's people that live in the 408, they have 510 telephone, cell phone numbers and stuff like that. So people don't really bother that, I guess. I guess the trend is going away from the identification. A lot of ways, however, it's kind of a, may also be sort of a way of finding you. If you think about it. Do you know in your 408 area code? You go, oh, most people think San Jose. So special IP addresses, IP defines a set of special addresses, forms that are reserved. And uh, types of addresses might be all zeros for this computer, the network. And this kind of goes into the fact that the 127, in terms of the local host, it's the suffix of any, it's a, it's a loop back. It goes to itself. It's for testing, essentially. Especially if you're on the same computer and you don't want to bother. It just goes through the loop back. Yep, with a zero 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 or zero zero one or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, most routers are in the same address too by default on your network. Is it one nine do one six eight dot one dot one or something or <laughs> as a default? Um, so once you get familiar with it, kind of the the ranges, and then you can start using them in terms of your networking programs and stuff. In terms of routers and IP addresses, each IP address identifies a connection between the computer and the network. Each router is assigned two or more IP addresses. The IP does not require that the same prefix be assigned in all of the interfaces of the router. You can have different ones. So routers can actually, intelligent routers can actually do a lot of different sophisticated uh, determination. So, especially if you take a look at the, you know, if you, routers got to do a lot of number crunching extremely easy in, in terms of the amount of data that's sent to it, and then looking at the data and we're going destination. And figuring out well which route was the destination, figuring out which next router to send this packet to so that it can actually find the destination. And um, there's uh, been a lot of experimentation over the years in terms of optimizing that algorithms to perfect. Routers pretty much do a good reliable job. It's the speed that could ca possibly cause a bottleneck if you've got bad routers along the line. Uh, but that stuff, equipment is pretty cheap these days. In the old days, Equipment was more expensive and people didn't upgrade. So, I mean, now we have routers that have firewalls on them, so it's great. So multi-homed host, a multi-home is a host computer that connects to multiple different networks, increases reliability, increases performance, has multiple addresses, one for each network connection that might exist. We have protocol addresses in terms of the frame transmitted across the physical network, this contain the hardware address. On the MAC address. And the next hop, the packs, packet's destination address, an IP address, all the information that's necessary to get the packet from point A to point B, the physical network itself, doesn't understand IP addressing. So that's why we have different levels of addressing. 
In fact, you see this with Ethernet networks because you've got the frame, the frame sent across given a physical network. You must use the frame's hardware frame format and also use the hardware's addresses as well. We addressing an Ethernet actually an Ethernet versus IP scheme comes into play when you start taking networking, like some of the certification stuff, and, uh, and you start looking at it and saying, like, ah, there's a lot of rules that follow through. So address resolution is that mapping of the protocol address and the hardware address. So the address resolution to a local is local to a network. So the computer never resolves the address of the computer that attaches to a remote network. So each computer that handles a packet resolves a next hop address before sending. So the technique itself depends upon the protocol and the hardware addressing scheme. You can have a table lookup that does the binding or the mapping for us. It stores a Stored in a table memory, such as software, searches when it needs to resolve an address. Well, a lookup table that's very common, still commonly used. Or a closed form computation, where the computer's hardware address can be computed uh, from a protocol address based on a Boolean or arithmetic operation that it might be given, an algorithm that it processes. And then uh, through a message exchange approach as well. Computers exchanging messages across the network to resolve an address. That's basically how UDP actually works, through message exchange addressing. And the table lookup technique in this particular example, the table consists of an array containing of a pair of protocols and the equivalent hardware addresses that are associated with it. And uh, a separate binding table is used for a physical network. Small network sequences uh, search might be used as well. For larger networks, we have hash or direct indexing. Indexing or hashing is actually needed, especially when you don't want the bottleneck to occur with the address lookup. You don't want the table to be so big and so complicated in terms of its searching technique that it creates a bottleneck for the network. In terms of that was the table lookup technique and the next couple slides go through table lookup, closed form, and then message exchange. In terms of the closed form technique, what we're looking at a little bit more detail, uh, configurable addresses, local network administration chooses both an hardware and an IP address. And uh, this is the one that uses a, some sort of a mathematical calculation or something to resolve the address, given the address. Um, so the values are chosen to optimize the translation. Instead of using a table or an index or hash to look something up, we're going to essentially perform a calculation on the address to resolve it. And uh, as an example, the host portion of the computer's IP can be chosen to be identical to the computer's hardware address. Um, so the sc naming scheme can vary depending upon the implementation. In terms of the message exchange technique to resolve the address, send a message across the network and receive a reply back. The message carries the protocol address. Uh, and then the reply carries the hardware address that might be uh, contained in terms of the client location. And then the address resolution request is sent to one or more resolve servers or each computer on the network, depending upon how it's configured. So. And in terms of the address resolution protocol, this is where we get in our, our ARP. So in terms of the standard itself, and this is the one that's most, uh, most commonly kind of, you know, two basic message formats. This is the old uh, Unix protocol. So request, uh, the ARP standard defines two basic message types, a request and a response. That's what we've seen so far. And the request message contains the IP address. It's placed in the hardware frame, broadcast to all the different computers along the network. And a response contains both the IP hardware address, but it is not broadcasted. Um, so the response is only sent to the appropriate, appropriate computer. In terms of the ARP message format, uh, in terms of the standard, it describes the general form of ARP messages. Um, so the specification is determined of the detail, the type of network address. Um, it's the header, essentially, that's going to give us the information that's associated with uh, the format. It's always using a 32-bit bit IP address to 48-bit Ethernet address. So it binds the two of those two addresses together. In terms of the messages and the frames, we're working with the concept of encapsulation. And it hides the detail from the actual implementation, but the format itself places the message inside of a frame for transport. And going back to my other example before, it's like the sushi boats are the frames. You put the sushi in the sushi boats, it goes around in a circle. That's how, that's how the internet works, <laughs> essentially, but the sushi boats are the frames instead of boats. So as encapsulated directly into the hardware frame. 
So the type field is the frame header specified by the frame that contains the art message. So it does not distinguish between a request and a response. All the frames look the same, actually. Same format used universally across the network. Which is the only way it really works, actually, if you think about it. All the frames are the same size, same format. Just sticks to all the boats are the same. <laughs> it just puts stuff on them. In terms of caching the responses themselves so they don't get lost, there's three packet traverse the network for an ARP transmission. To reduce the traffic, it might extract and save the information, cache it locally, so we don't have to keep loading and unloading it. The messages, uh, the ARP messages, the table, manages the table as a cache itself. This is the binding present without a transmission or a request. So the binding is not present, it has to broadcast for a request and waits for a response, updates the cache, proceeds to use the binding once it is created. So in terms of processing an ARP message, the receiver must perform two basic tasks, extract the sender's address binding and then check its presence, make sure it actually exists, determine whether the message is a request or a response and then deal with it appropriately. So after the computer replies, the computer extracts the sender's binding address. So and optimize is done because most computers communicate involves two-way traffic that goes back and forth instead of one send and receive channel. And a computer cannot store an arbitrary number of address bindings. It has to be kind of fixed. So. In terms of the layering of addressing, in terms of the address resolution associated with the network and the interface layer, this depends upon the implementation. So address resolution software hides the details of the physical addressing. And uh, applications, higher level protocol softwares are built to use the protocol addressing only. So, in fact, nowadays we don't even use the addressing, we just use domain lookup. In fact, it uh, makes it a little bit easier as well. Because nobody sits around thinking about addresses. Nobody actually really thinks about addresses. So, in fact, when I pulled up this lecture, I started thinking to myself, how many students actually really think about IP addresses? <laughs> nobody does. <laughs> it's like an abstraction of the past or something, but it's still around. It's still part of networking. So the concept of virtual packets is also a part uh, in terms of TCP IP designers including protocols for both connection and connectionless oriented. We just saw those. In fact, uh, that was the, we spent most of the day talking about UDP and TCP over IP, which is nothing more than the abstraction uh, of the virtual packet itself. And the application programs remain unaware of the underlying physical network, although uh, you can run these different protocols. Routers forward each packet uh, from one network to another. It doesn't really matter what the purpose of the packet's for. No fixed frame format because the routers can connect to different types of networks, to heterogeneous types of networks. And then we have this universal virtual packet concept, which is the internet packet format. It's independent of the hardware. So that's where IP plays the game, the reason why I mentioned this lecture. So this kind of gave you the background on IP. It's the universal datagram packet. So the packet sent across TCP IP internet, each datagram consists of a header followed by the data. That's really all you need to know for the purposes of this course. Source and destination addresses in the datagram header are IP addresses. So whether you're sending a stream or whether you're sending a datagram itself, actually, it's both all imp implemented in the form of IP datagrams. Um, the size of the uh, datagram itself uh, might vary uh, depending upon the application mix. IP adaptable for a variety of different types of applications. We have forwarding an IP datagram as an example. The datagram traverses from source to destination through the routers. Each IP router keeps information in its routing table about available networks that it's familiar with. Each destination <coughs> list in the router table is a network, not an individual host. So it goes from network to network, subnet to subnet in terms of routing. And the sophistication of the routing tables and the lookup of the routing tables and the awareness of routes that are not down, that are still active, uh, makes the routing faster. So in practice, IP routing table is complex and contains many different things. I'm not going to go through the routing tables. And for the purposes of this course, you don't have to know anything about routing actually at all. So I'm going to kind of skip through that a little bit. Skip to the routing table. If you're interested, it is uh, starting, uh, this is... I can't remember, lecture five, I believe. Uh, starting on page 35 is going to go through your routing in terms of the table configuration. Routing table entries on slide number 36. And 37 hmm, is going to go through uh, techniques for uh, you know, optimizing it, essentially, coming up with a design for network hardware. 
Is, is it lecture five? Yes. Okay, good. Very good. So the header format of the IP datagram, each field in the IP datagram has a fixed size to it, and we have fields that are uh, designed for different purposes. The datagram transmission and the encapsulation occurs through the hardware, so the network hardware does not understand datagram formatting or addressing. Instead, it just picks it up and sends it on. It's kind of like um, the encapsulation hides the details from the network, so the entire datagram is placed in a data area of the frame. If you're going to build protocol suites on top of IP, if you're actually implementing your own version of UDP as an example, or your own version of any type of protocol, then you would need to be familiar with the uh, contents of page 38 here. In terms of, and this is old, actually. This is not current information, so don't take this as valid. This is, I want to say, yeah, it's probably IP4, but it's probably a little bit outdated as things have increased and changed and become more sophisticated. There is areas of the IP header, however, in which you can send and receive information uh, and include. There's extra padding in there, space, for which you can embed uh, messages and all sorts of different pieces of information, depending upon the implementation of your protocol. So if you're at the level of writing your own version or modifying a protocol that's in existence, um, there's been a lot of experimentation with uh, using some of that. And IP6 actually added more space, so there's a bit more usability to it, uh, which hopefully will uh, advance the growth of um, more protocols, essentially. Uh, so in terms of the transmission across the network, we're looking at uh, when a datagram arrives in a network frame, the receiver extracts the datagram, it discards the frame header, and it sends it, and it strips away and kind of looks at uh, the next location. Um, the next part of this slide set comes into things associated with quality of service and network status and network transmission speeds and all sorts of different internetworking technologies. And for the purposes of not boring you completely or replacing any of your previous courses you've had in this, I'm going to actually sort of skip through this even faster because it's a little tedious. Nothing questions, nothing, no questions on this at all. This is for those people who have never taken a networking course before. Uh, so starting around page 41, we're looking at maximum transmission unit encapsulation. In terms of the data, datagram size, the reassembly of datagrams. So we all know we, the, the information itself doesn't go in a hole. Like when we send some information, it gets broken out into smaller pieces. And each one of the pieces are self-identifiable. Like this little piece number one, two, three. And then these pieces get reassembled at the destination. So we have breaking it out techniques, breaking them out into smaller chunks of data that can fly through the network easily, and then reassembling techniques, error checking techniques, checksum, stuff like that. Um, long story short, we're trying to share equal access. So, you know, if, if your data was actually, if your datagram actually was sent, or your data was sent without using datagram as a concept, only one person at a time would be able to send anything. So to give that asynchronous, synchro, excuse me, the synchronization of everybody sending and receiving simultaneously, the smaller you can make those chunks, the better, because then you can fit a lot of stuff. You can share the bandwidth with everybody. Sure. In terms of the concept, that brings up issues in terms of what's referred to as the datagram. So I identified a datagram itself. Fragment loss, success of the IP. <laughs> IP say the IP6 is in here. Let's take a look, brief look because I'm kind of curious myself. Actually, I haven't looked at this slide in a long time. Current IP version is IP4 is the making of the slide. Again, a slide that's kind of a couple years old. So, a uh, newer version becomes IP6. IP6 is around right now. It retains many different features of IP4 connectionless. It's the same concept actually. New features. Let's see what the slide set says. Each IP6 address contains 128 bits instead of 32. So it's a significant increase. The header format, we knew about the header, I knew about the header format, right? Completely different. It's totally, been totally rewritten. Extension headers, yep. Uh, IP6 encodes information into separate headers. So it actually allows for more reading and usability. Supports audio and video as well includes mechanisms that allow the sender and the receiver to establish a high quality path. Actually, that is an interesting point. It, IP6 is supposed to be better for um, 
high definition and uh, for applications that are using a high definition <coughs> image or trying to present a high definition image that optimizes the transport of the audio and the video. Especially because when you're streaming something over the internet, you want it to be in sync. <laughs> you want the video and the, the guy talking and the words coming out of his mouth to actually look like it's supposed to. And uh, extensible, as I mentioned before, it does, uh, IP6 does not specify all possible protocol features. Um, it allows actually for some implementation. So for people who are building their own protocol base, they're just going to work on IP. Um, we haven't had very much experimentation with it, but uh, it does allow for it does for allow for some extension. It doesn't implement a lot of stuff. It kind of leaves it open in terms of and in, believe it or not, IP isn't open source. It's not owned by anybody. It's open source in terms of it. You can't change it around though, because otherwise your packets and excuse me, your information is not going to be transmitted equally. It's not going to work properly with the rest of the system. I'm not going to go through the base header format, but there is one assignment that has you compare IP4 with IP6, and here is the slide set, slide set number five. It's going to give you the necessary information. So The uh, header is actually twice as large as the IP4 header, but contains less information, which is kind of weird. Multiple headers, because actually you can put a header inside of a header on IP6. You couldn't do that on IP4. So it's a little bit possible to, to add a next header, next field in there. Fragment reassembly path. Mm. A few more features in terms of uh, replaces fields for separate fragments for extension headers. Presence of headers identified diagrams as fragments themselves. Sending a header, the sending host is responsible for the fragmentation. Purpose of multiple headers, you can go ahead and read through this on your own. This is actually the theme of one of your assignments. So, and in terms of IP addressing, um, in terms of IP6 addressing, it's actually done a little bit differently, um, slightly differently, which is why we have to support both 4 and 6 right now, because the addressing scheme has uh, been altered. It's been optimized. Uh, assigns a unique address for each one of the connections between the con well, which is IP4 does the same thing. Uh, addresses do not have to define classes, however. In the 4 version, it does define classes, and it works with that class structure, so it kind of breeze through at the beginning, class A, B, C. Uh, IP6 doesn't actually adhere to that strictly. And uh, no one of three basic types might exist. Each address has one of three basic types. Unicast, multicast, or anycast, in terms of its trans transmission. So corresponds to single computers, corresponds to sets of computers, or corresponds to... Uh, common address prefixes or any cast. X decimal location notation, you can read through this on your own, read through the best effort semantics and error detection on your own. And to control message protocol, another, this has been around actually for a while on a slightly different topic. IP uses the send error messages themselves. So it sends an error message that uses ICMP as the error message protocol to uh, transport the messages and list the messages themselves by index. And you, we, a lot of people who build network applications are concerned with the net, network codes because if you can dissect the error message from the code, you can kind of figure out what, what happened, why, why we had failure, why the packets didn't make it, things of that nature. So you may read through that on your own as well. And it's really a topic for a networking course, uh, so using the messages themselves. So, And as promised, it was only about a half hour, which isn't too bad. Uh, so this, as you can see, this particular lecture is a review of IP and IP addressing. will come in handy for one of the assignments. Um, the concept and the reason why it's in here is because we're using, in fact, we did it today with UDP and TCP and even with RMI. There's a lot of addressing stuff that goes on, so it's not a bad idea to have a background at least. Um, and if you have never taken a networking course before, I highly recommend reading through this lecture and coming up to speed with uh, at least some of the terminology in terms of the addressing. So it will help the novice actually kind of figure out why we're we using localhost. What's the 127.0.0.1? What is all this other stuff that we're talking about? And how does TCP differ from IP and UDP differ from IP and how RMI differs from all the three. So, so we covered a lot of topics in our first meeting. And uh, next time we're going to see I am RMI work uh, because I'm going to go through and clean up those examples. And uh, 
I will leave S code alone. I'll leave that one alone because a lot of people have already downloaded it and have looked at it already. Um, what I'm going to do is probably build another one and okay. load it up a separate and a separate example, a fixed one. Uh, looking at the current API for Java, there's many different issues that could have caused a problem with that example. It may have been depreciated library, depreciated techniques, newer versions of the RMI registry, who knows what could have been the problem. So I will revisit, create some brand new examples that demonstrate it well. And I might actually even create a video. If I do create the video, it will probably be up in here. Um, which is why I'm showing you this this area here. You can find it on the YouTube site, but you, mo you will also be able to find it in here. And you guys are the weekend section. However, on your weekend video lectures, if you haven't noticed, they're going to be posted here. And the weekend one means that this is the first weekend. We'll have a second weekend, a third weekend. Uh, actually, we'll just have a first and a second. We won't have a third. Uh, in terms of the video lectures, these are for the day, stu the weekday students, and we've only into the second week so far. So what you're going to end up with is the ability to go back and um, I probably should put the topics underneath it maybe. I might actually um, edit this to put the topics of what was covered so you can go back and say, I really need to help with the RMI. Because when I do this for the weekday class, I'm going to have my new examples and the RMI stuff's going to work. So if you want to see the, uh, uh, hopefully I, I might just swap that lecture out with a different one, who knows. But this stuff might vary a little bit, is what I'm saying, versus what you're going to, what you're getting. Um, and obviously, hopefully, you have found the location for the assignments for the projects. In here is where you're going to find the PowerPoint lectures uh, and the uh, source code that goes with it. And here's this. This is where that S code file is from. So, next class meeting. The date of the next class meeting of utmost importance is actually put on here. I'm showing that the next class meeting is going to be February 25th and 26th. Is that correct, TA? Okay, good. So we're, we have actually about a month. So we have about a month. Nothing is due until May 1st, and it is uploaded into the LMS for new people, anyone who's listening to the video perhaps. You guys know of this already. Uh, what else have I forgotten? Uh, what have I forgotten to tell you announcement-wise? Um, mandatory, you must attend at least two of the three. So you guys who attended this weekend, you don't actually have to attend next if you don't want to. You do have to show up for the third one. That's the final exam. It's all those people who did not show up for the first class weekend this weekend who need to show up next time. And we'll be sending out a nasty message to the entire class uh, probably a week, two weeks. Maybe we should, maybe actually, maybe we should send it out next week, actually, only because they need to book airline flights. <laughs> if we send it out a week before, I'm going to get a bunch of people sending me messages back. You know, it's too late for me to book a flight. The airfare is too expensive. So let's work on that this week. So if you receive a message, it's not directed at you. It's directed at the absentees, absentee students. And uh, they're the ones who are mandatory to show up next time. Because uh, if they don't show up next time, they're not going to get a grade in the course, essentially. And all of them are going to be shocked when they get the an F, and they're going to go, well, I didn't understand. No, there's no excuse. So, All right, done lecturing. Any uh, questions, comments, or concerns? You know, I loaded you with a bunch of work for a month. You could do the first two projects and the, uh, most of the assignments. Ah, oh, very good question. Uh, the next class meeting... Uh, no, I will probably, your final exam for this course is going to be on March 24th and 25th. And as a side note for the final exam, the way that's going to run is that you will show up one day of the two. So if you're booking tickets ahead of time, either come on a Saturday or come on a Sunday, but you don't have to come both days. So you can make it a quick fly and take the test and come back out. I'm not going to lecture that weekend. Instead, I'm going to cram full the first two weekends. Um, the question papers will probably be multiple choice in nature, and I will post a special final exam review, and I will put it uh, in a video. If I think about it, I'm not sure I'm going to have it ready because it's March. Uh, March. Well, actually, it's February. It's next month that I would have to do it if I did it at the second class meeting, which is February, March. Uh, I'm probably not going to have it ready for the next class meeting. Instead, in the middle between, I'll make a video out of it. And I usually do two things. I usually post a Microsoft Word document that I put out here. And I'll usually put it out next to the syllabus. So in the uh, 
in the course area right up here it'll say final exam review doc and then I'll do a video that does it. It'll be done um, probably a couple weeks mm, a couple weeks before the final so you have a couple weeks to study uh, to expect what to expect on it right now I can tell you that um, no programming will be required and that it will be multiple choice, fill in the blank, short answer, um, theory questions. Uh, nothing on IP, nothing on internet. The question bank will come from RMI, UDP, TCP over IP, the examples that we went through in terms of what is TCP, what is UDP, what is RMI. It will cover JSP, servlets, it will cover JDBC. It's not going to, obviously, I'm not going to ask you SQL questions. I'm not going to ask you questions about Oracle because you don't have to use an Oracle. So it'll be multiple choice. Huh? JDNI, if I get to it, or JNI. The naming, the naming interface, if I get to it. It depends on how far I get, which is why I hesitate writing it before the next weekend or, you know, before the next interactive session. Um, Sometime after the interactive session, after I figure out what I've covered, it'll be based on that. So, but I'll give you a topic list. Um, nothing having to do with any of the background information. Nothing on IP. Nothing on that lecture I just gave you, actually. But there is a homework assignment on that lecture. Yes. It's, just a, but, it's not based. Uh, the exam is not going to be based on the assignments. Uh, the assignments are mostly uh, coding. And if I've already asked you the question in the assignment, why am I going to ask you the question on an exam? Think about it. But um, it's going to be concept based. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not going to ask you what's the name of the JDBC driver for MySQL. You know, I'm not going to ask you questions like that. It's going to be like, you know, um, well, I, I actually went through six steps yeah, for the well, JDBC. You know, what are the six steps to connect to a from using JDBC to connect to a database? That's a reasonable question to ask. For RMI, I might ask you what's the daemon used for. You know, or Oh, either one. If you're interested in Oracle, I've got a how to install Oracle. It's a 10G lecture. 10G demonstration, it goes out and downloads and installs it on an XP system. It works the same for 11G. There's also a video for the drivers. If you missed, did you miss yesterday? You missed, that's why we, went to, we did that yesterday. Yeah. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, you can catch up, no problem. But the, the level of the questions, uh, you know, in terms of RMI, uh, we haven't seen the examples yet. We're going to see them next time. But uh, the, the questions aren't going to be, you know, how do you run the registry? How do you run, what's RMIC or anything like that? It's, it's on concept, you know. What's the purpose of the registry? What's the purpose of the daemon? Um, what are some of the things, you know, can you run a constructor from remote? How many objects actually get instantiated? from a remote object, it's just one. And you can answer all those questions because we just reviewed this stuff. But that's kind of like the level of the questions. It's basic knowledge to know, did you actually look at the material? Did you actually understand anything? Did you do the assignments kind of thing? In fact, the exam is, I, I think my exams are quite easy, actually. Overall, I think I give out some easy exams. Generally, they're very easy. In fact, people still fail them, which is surprising. I think they're extremely easy, but people still get Fs on them, which is kind of amazing. So, and then they come back, I thought I did well. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> All right. Any other good questions before we end? No? You all know how to reach me. You can always send me an email message if you do have more questions. bhacker at itu.edu. Uh, you can't post to this board anymore. I took that away. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? A uh, good question. On a MacBook, I have not successfully installed Oracle. I have made many attempts. Oh, the class path for what? Are you talking about for Java? Uh, that's easy to install on a MacBook. Are you making it on a MacBook? It's on Windows. Oh, that's not the one you're talking about then. Um, actually, it comes. I didn't install. That's what. That's why when I started running, when I started running the, um, when I started running those RMI examples, I was in the back of my mind thinking it's not going to be installed. I didn't install. But the thing is, I never installed it. 
it came. It was already on it. So it's actually, if you have a MacBook and you haven't done anything with it at all, just go to DOS prompt and uh, type in Java. You probably have Java installed on it. You might not have all the RMI stuff. In fact, that might be, that's not one of the reasons why mine's not working, but you uh, can easily update it. But it should, or it may actually already be on there. I actually have, I don't know how I have it. Maybe I have it from the past, and that may also be another issue. I might have an older version of the EE edition on the Mac side of it. On the Windows side, there's no excuses. That should have worked, but and the example is a couple years old, written for, you know, maybe Java 1 point something, rather, you know, 1.3 or 1.2 probably back then. I guarantee things have probably changed, so. That's why we're going to revisit RMI and the better examples next, next uh, in March, or excuse me, February, uh, so that we can actually see it working correctly. And uh, keep your eyes out. You'll probably see a tutorial video up here, how to, how to use RMI. Um, and Because I'm, I'm actually kind of thinking about putting it together because it'll be a little easier uh, because I'll have to explain the files, the file sets, and I'll keep them separate. So it'll make it a little easier. If I'm going to have to do that, I might as well just make a video at the same time. So. Anyway, any other good questions before we end for today? No? Then we're done. Thank you all for showing. And uh, We still have a little bit of the day left, so I'll end this video.